Social marketing and human behaviour change. Professor French. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> didn't get much of a clap. <laughs> no, no. What I want is just this half of the audience to clap. What about this half? Better. Okay, I'm just going to speak to you. Okay. Can you hear me okay with this? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. One of the things you didn't say in your introduction, because I didn't ask you to say it, was I am one of the world's uh, experts in social marketing. I learned about social marketing about 25 years ago. I was a public health specialist at the time, focused on largely chronic disease and trying to influence people. And I was lucky enough, I, I did an MBA at that point, and I discovered marketing, and a thing called social marketing, which um, I thought I'd kind of invented when I did the course. I thought, oh, marketing, we can apply this in public health. But I discovered that people have been doing this for quite a long time, and there's a whole... Uh, set of theories and methodologies and so on. So for the last 20 years, I've been working in that field. I work on issues uh, largely in health, chronic disease, but also acute, um, transport issues, energy issues, forestry issues, environmental issues, and the last five or six years uh, on some animal-related uh, issues. I've written two uh, systematic evidence reviews. If you're interested in them, come see me. Uh, one on obesity in pets, what we know about affecting that and what we don't, and largely we don't know much because most of the research is crap. Uh, second, uh, uh, more recent review last year, looking at the health benefits of the human-animal bond and what we know about that and what, what we can say. But today, I'm going to focus on social marketing, uh, what it is and so on. Okay. Uh, social marketers and marketers, we marketing guys, also work on commercial marketing projects, uh, focus on a thing we call uh, customer insight and understanding. This is about deep truths about what is going on in your head so we can influence you to do either socially good things or buy products and services. So just look at these shapes and colours on, on the screen and I'm going to run what's called a psychographic test with you. This is about getting inside your head and getting you to disclose something about yourself. Pick, you've had a, quite a while to look at those shapes and colours now. Pick one that you think best represents the way you operate at work. Okay, um, then I'm going to get you to disclose which one. Uh, don't worry, none of them mean you're doing a bad thing. They're all good. <laughs> okay. So put your hand up uh, if you are a green square, do you think? Okay, about 5% of you. Green squares, first thing about green squares is they're brave. They'll put their hand up before they know what's coming. Okay. Uh, you like process. You want a good, solid plan about how to get from A to B. What about um, red triangles? Oh, even less, very few. Less than 5%. They don't care about uh, process. What you want to do is hit the target. Okay, that's what you want. Achieve the goal. What about blue uh, stars? Ah, okay. <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? 80% plus of you. You don't care about process or targets. You're the creative types. You like new challenges that you can invent you know, unique solutions to. And what about uh, yellow circles? Oh, again, okay. Some people voting twice. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you're, you don't care about any of that stuff. You know, you just like having a good time. <laughs> Today's a chance to get away from work and have a chill out. You know. okay. uh, now, none of that is true. I do roll you now, maybe. I've run that th it seems to work, actually, in reality. But it's an idea about getting people to think, or get, me getting inside your head and understanding you. Because unless I understand you, I have no chance of influencing you at all. So a lot of marketing is about getting inside people's heads. One of the best definitions I've ever heard of great marketing and social marketing is if you spend enough time and effort listening to people, they will give you the answer. Okay? That's what marketing does. We don't waste money guessing solutions. Okay? We spend money 
creating solutions that we know are going to work before we execute them. Um, one of the big problems we have when we come to apply marketing principles to create social good, like tackling uh, animal welfare, is a lot of people that work in kind of caring professions and organisations don't like the idea of marketing because it is bad, it's manipulative, it's tricking people into buying stuff they don't really need, playing on their weaknesses and so on. Okay? Uh, and in the commercial sector, in some commercial sectors, that is true. Um, if you're one of the people that have some difficulty with the language of marketing, just put that aside for 30 minutes and think about the principles and how you can apply them. Because I think, um, from my, and I've worked on all kinds of um, population behavioural change programmes around the world, um, social marketing is the best set of software we've got for creating effective social programmes. Okay, so we're not all liars. <laughs> um, and we're not all evil. <laughs> this is what we're going to cover in the next 30 minutes. Uh, some of the big challenges that we have in your field and globally. What we know about how to promote well-being, uh, how marketing can help, uh, and uh, what social marketing is and how you can do it. Okay. First problem I have when I speak with my colleagues, particularly in public health, when I talk about health uh, uh, and uh, animal welfare is uh, they think it's a joke. Okay? Why am I wasting my public health skills and experience thinking about animal welfare when it is of little relevance? Okay. Okay? So overcoming that, working with other professional groups, is one of the first challenges. Okay. Um, animals uh, are obviously exist in their own right but also many of them interact with human beings, as we've heard already this morning. And what human beings do impacts on animals and animal welfare and health. In the chronic um, uh, field of, of human health, huge problem. Okay. We are in some countries reaching peak fat and, ob and obesity, like America, but other countries like this one, we're catching up still. Uh, that has a huge spillover effect. I would say a tsunami of uh, ill health and poor life experience for human pets as well. Okay. Huge problem, huge economic problem and drug factor as well. Um, pets, as you know more than I do, again, it's a huge problem. Okay. Next challenge we have is that lots of people, when they look at the evidence, including myself, who do systematic reviews of evidence, is I look at the evidence and I say, we don't know what to do because most of the evidence, most of the trials, are not very good. We can't extrapolate from them. So, what, we have a huge problem. Um, what can we do? N nothing. Don't have to do it. Big problem. Doom and gloom. No. And I'll show you, again, in the next 25 minutes or so, we know a huge amount how to create successful population and individual-based programs for positive change. So we can address this problem uh, directly. Okay, How do we, what do we know about promoting well-being? Many of these lessons are drawn from the kind of you know, human psychology, uh, uh, anthropology, sociology, uh, marketing, and so on. Okay, um, the first thing we know is that people need to agree and support restrictions and penalties. If you want to use law and legislation and forcing people to do stuff, they have to support that. Otherwise, they rebel and sabotage it. This is a photograph I took in Turkey. It's the law, and you get fined if you don't wear a seatbelt in Turkey. This is a taxi driver who's driving me from the airport. Nobody in Turkey wears a seatbelt, even though it's the law. In fact, they go into the local market, and you can buy a clip to put in your thing to stop the car bleeping at you. Okay? Why? I said to this guy, why, you know, why are you not wearing a seatbelt? I feel really uncomfortable if I'm in a car not wearing a seatbelt. He said, because they're dangerous. If, I get, if there's an accident, I'll get trapped and I may die. That's what he believes. Okay? The evidence says no, but that's what he believes. Can't do anything about getting people to do stuff unless they believe and support it. Uh, this is a, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Greece, doing some work out there. The Greeks are even smarter. Okay? They don't bother buying a new clip, they just put it around the back of their seat and uh, plug it in. This is a different taxi driver. Save more money. Greeks in a big financial problem. As you know. 
So we can try and smack people into change, use legislation to get them to change. And these are some examples from the human world uh, where legislation has been brought in. Uh, but the first thing that happens is people start to rebel against this. They'll go across borders to buy products and so on. And you also get new administrations coming in who take away these unpopular laws. So there has to be broad public consent for legislative uh, examples of change. They can absolutely help, of course they can, once there is broad popular support. Just the last example about forcing people to do stuff through design. Uh, uh, this is from uh, uh, the Netherlands. Anybody from the Netherlands here? Okay, you may have seen this one. This is a, it was a bus stop, and when you sit on the bench, um, your weight is displayed. <laughs> On the, uh, and your weight is announced. Okay. Not many people sat on the bench. <laughs> this was actually a publicity stunt, but you get it. Okay. Convincing people. Okay, so we have to convince people. Convincing people they're wrong is very, very difficult. Because we get entrenched in our beliefs, we like to think that we're consistent. Uh, giving them the means to do what they're already doing, but a bit better, a bit faster, and a bit easier for social good is possible, however. Okay, this leads me on to another problem that we face. When I work with governments uh, and, and agencies, unfortunately I can't be here after today. I'm going to, to Finland to speak to uh, some ministers in the Finnish government about applying social marketing and to the European Social Marketing Conference, which takes place on Thursday and Friday of this week, is anybody going to that? Maybe from Finland? Okay. There's about 200 of your colleagues who work on social marketing across Europe and the world meeting in Espoo in Finland this week. They'd be delighted to talk to you about any of this stuff. Um, one of the problems we have when we work with agencies and governments and NGOs trying to persuade people to do things is they apply SPLAT. SPLAT is the answer to everything. Okay? SPLAT stands for some posters, leaflets, apps and TV. <laughs> before we know what the problem is, before we know what's going on inside people's heads, they come to the table, particularly if there are strong comms people there, what's the campaign? What's the message? What kind of TV spots are we going to have? What kind of social media? And what I say to that is three things. No, no, no. That is not where we start. We need to understand what's going on in here, what's going to help people, what's not. It might be some of these things. It might be some other things that we need to do. It might be redesigning our service and the way, uh, maybe even the times that it's open. Okay. Uh, and this also leads to the other solution, which is SAP, which stands for spray and pray. <laughs> if you have enough money, this can work. Okay? If you're Coca-Cola or an equivalent organisation, and you're going to spend billions promoting your product or service, this can work. Even if it's not very good promotions, the sheer weight will influence people ultimately. Most of us working on social issues don't have that kind of budget. So we need to think a bit more. So we know that knowing is not doing. This isn't Ed Balls, by the way, <laughs> pretty strictly. Um, if it was, nobody would be overweight, nobody would smoke, nobody would overfeed their dog, etc. Okay. Um, just an example of this, and it doesn't matter about the severity of the condition. People that have had a, a major bypass operation, what percentage of them, after their health promotion, <coughs> health education, change their lifestyles? About one in nine. Okay. Behaviours are deeply ingrained going to change them or shift them, we need to understand and develop sophisticated programs. Uh, the answer is not just information. Body condition and scores, kind of something I've looked at the uh, uh, last few years. Is this an answer? People don't recognise their dogs and cats and pets are fat. Let's give them some simple visual aids. Now, I'm not saying these things are bad, but they are not going to work of themselves. People can't tell if their kids are overweight, let alone whether they're Pets are overweight. Okay. Um, also, lots of the promotional work that I see out there in human, but also kind of pet uh, health and well-being field, is just bad. It's just poor. 
It's dull, it's boring, it's guesswork, it's unappealing, it's not researched. Okay? If you're going to play this game, you have to do it professionally. Otherwise, don't do it, would be my suggestion to you. Okay. This is, and some of it is just really cr crazy. This is a, a set of uh, uh, drugs, and it says alcohol. This contains alcohol. It may uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, impact on your performance. Uh, I suppose that's true for a working dog, but for most dogs, <laughs> that's not going to be very relevant. Um, so we know that knowledge, um, uh, as Benny was saying, not necessary, doesn't necessarily work like this. Increased knowledge, attitudes change, behaviour change. We know from a whole range of research fields this often doesn't happen. It can happen, it's not very likely though. Okay. So telling and selling is not the way to go. Another problem we have is trust. If we think, oh, I'm a veterinarian, although it's good, good to see more research that uh, they, uh, they are kind of um, good spokespeople for this, but just telling people stuff, even from a position of authority, often doesn't get people to change. People don't trust people anymore, but still about 80% of people trust people like me, professors. Only 20% of what I say is bullshit. Okay. <laughs> but you, when you're down here, no chance. Official government warnings and that, that kind of stuff. This is because citizens are becoming empowered. We are becoming educated, wealthier, more numerous, endless access to information, um, huge social networks. This is a fantastic uh, set of steps and progress in human evolution. This means largely we want to be active co-contributors to creating solutions. We don't want people changing us for their ends anymore. Okay. Uh, put up your hand uh, if you were born between 1950 and 1970. Okay, uh, you have a problem, you have an ageing workforce. <laughs> okay. You're getting old like me. Um, uh, you're what we call in marketing generation LX. Okay? You've got most of the money, you've got most of the assets, you spend more on luxury products and holidays than <coughs> younger people do. And you want it how you want it. Okay? And if you don't get it, you don't buy it, you walk away. What about if you're born... And put up your hand if you're born after 1970. Oh, okay, that's, that's good. Um, there's quite a few of you. Uh, you're even worse, or better, <laughs> should I say. <laughs> You're more demanding, and you will tell hundreds of people if you get bad service. Okay? We have to respond to this shift in power also if we're going to influence people. So it's not about experts saying, do this, because we know. It's about citizen-centric models. What do you think about it? How can we work together? How can we create some solutions? I think you're going to get all of these slides. So if I can see a few people scribbling away notes. You get them all, so don't worry. I just listen if I were you. Um, okay, we are the problem, not our pets or animals. If you want to influence people to create you know, better uh, animal welfare, you have to think about the humans and how we can influence them. Okay. This is a photograph I took in Greenwich Park uh, about, uh, this summer, lovely summer, and what you can see is human beings, without being told, space themselves out equally. <laughs> Uh, there are certain social rules. We understand these. We know a lot about how to influence people and what's going on in here, how people will make decisions, what they will go for and what they won't. I, used to, I started my career as a biologist. That's another example of this. Pick. One of these shapes is called boobar. The other shape is called kiki. Okay? One's called boobar, one's called kiki. Make up your mind which is which, and then I'll get you to disclose it. Okay? At the count of three, put up your hand if you think. One, two, three, this one's Kiki. Oh, wow, okay. Put up your hands if you thought the other way. There's always a few deviants. Okay. <laughs> Most people, 95, 98% of people, will pick this way. It's the way our brains are kind of wired up. Okay, I won't go into it now. Um, we know a lot about behavioural psychology, behavioural economics, social psychology, human evolution, uh, and so on. This is playing into some new thinking about how we influence people in government uh, and NGOs across the world. Us marketing people have known about this since most of the original research was done back in the 70s. It's not new. Mind 
space, nudge, you know, all of that kind of stuff is old hat to us marketers. We've been doing this for a long time. It's the application of these things uh, that we need to get into more in social context, I think. So there's a ton of these books, popularised lots of the research, but most of the research is not particularly new. Okay, and there's, I'm not going to go into any of this stuff, it's just there for your reference. We know a lot about all of this stuff, about how people will make decisions, which way they're more likely to jump. The thing is, we have to apply this understanding alongside our research about what's going on in here uh, around particular issues and uh, 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 problems. So, influencing social behaviour is complicated. I mean, it requires effort and application of science and planning. It's not guesswork. The application of science and planning is what social marketing is. Okay. So, what is social marketing? How do we apply it? How can we use marketing principles? Even if we don't use the word, I don't care whether you call things social marketing or not, do you apply the principles? Okay, so what's marketing? If you go and do a marketing degree at the moment, this, uh, in, in any good university, they'll talk to you about many things, uh, but three of the core principles they'll teach you about, anybody, anybody put up your hand if you're a marketer, any marketing training? Good, okay, if I get anything, chip in, we get to questions. You've certainly been taught these three core modules on your course. How do we create value or social value in our instance? Relationship marketing and service and intangible benefits or service marketing. Okay. These are three big things that you'll be taught. The most important of those three things is create value. This is what marketing is about. How do we create, not how do we sell crap stuff to people, it's how do we create value for them? Because that's what they'll come back for. That's why I'm prepared to buy a pair of trainers for like two, I'm not, 200 quid, okay, as opposed to a pair of trainers for five pounds. Well, functionally, they'll do exactly the same job. Why are these worth 200 pounds? Largely not because of the materials, but because of my perception of them. They have a brand or, or whatever it might be. Okay. Create social value is the key thing. Um, and that's about making it easier and desirable for people. Okay. Um, social marketing, as I've already said, is the best, I think, set of software we've got for creating effective social programs. You can get, I, I wrote this guide for the European Centers for Disease Control. It's their first technical guide on social marketing published last year, sorry, 2014 end of. And it's a free to use resource, so when you get the slides you can find it or you can just uh, look it up now. And it's a, a guide, a step-by-step -step guide to what is social marketing, how to do it, and a whole set of tools to fill in to create a social marketing plan. Okay. Um, does it work? Yes, it does. You know, there have been a lot of systematic reviews around the application of social marketing. This is from CDC in the States, biggest public health institution in the world. This systematic review said, yeah, it adds real value. There's lots of evidence sources uh, that you can look at afterwards. What we're trying to do in social marketing is not just show people stuff or make people do stuff, it's about helping people change and create some social value for themselves and society. Uh, when we look at it, this is what it is. I won't go to, into this in any detail. If you're interested, see me. I can give you some references and point you out some fantastic books that I've written and they're very reasonable. Okay. Uh, uh, Co-creation of social value. I'm going to keep saying value creation. When you're in your meetings with people, and you talk about when you, you know, how we're going to do this project, think, that's the one thing, take away from today, how do we create value by doing this for people? Social value, that's the key principle. These four key concepts, value development and delivery, citizens' uh, insight, uh, explicit goals and objectives, and competition analysis and action. Okay? Then there's a whole bunch of techniques that we can apply. And I'm going to walk you through the key concepts. Okay. So these are the things we're going to take a quick look at. Okay, co-creation and delivery of social value. This is an example from the commercial world. I'm talking about Virgin Atlantic. This is really pertinent. We didn't uh, rehearse this. I've actually stopped, I think I just stopped doing these. Um, anybody flown first class Virgin Atlantic London to New York? <laughs> I thought you were veterinarians. I thought you were. 
obviously not working marketing, that's for sure. Um, when you work in, uh, when you fly first class Virgin Atlantic, you don't get a little crappy plastic tray with some rubbish food on it uh, and a half a Heineken lager. You get a nice proper tray with a linen tablecloth, knife and fork, metal, nice glass of, several glasses of wine. And on the tray you have a nice little cruet set, salt and pepper set, that look like this. Okay, so you've paid about, what, uh, $1,000 or thereabouts, uh, plus uh, for your flight, uh, first class. You had a nice meal, a few glasses of wine. You're sitting there waiting for your tray to be taken away. And what are you thinking, if you're anything like me? <laughs> I'm going to nick those, okay? They look cute. They won't miss them. Uh, I've paid a lot of money. They're mine. Um, when the uh, air cabin crew come through and they pick up your lo lovely tray, they don't say, where's the cruet set? Have you stolen it? <laughs> because they know a lot of people, or about a third of people, are going to do that. Uh, some people look on the bottom and it says, pinched from Virgin Atlantic. <laughs> but about half people don't see that until they get home. Okay? What this does is this cruet set costs nothing couple of dollars, okay? But it creates that kind of reaction. It's a laugh. When you laugh with somebody, it's why humour is so powerful, that creates a connection. That means we share a value, okay? This is a little joke between me and Virgin Atlantic. This means we're connected with each other. I don't need to, you know, so next time I'm going to book a flight, a little thought, oh, Virgin Atlantic, that doesn't have to happen very many times for this thing to pay for itself. Okay? It's about creating a relationship and buy some shared value uh, with the company. Okay, this is a social example. A colleague of mine, Avis Johns, developed this program down in Plymouth, spreading all over the world now, including in places in Australia and America. We are world-class drinkers in this country. Okay? I think the Belgians beat us and Germans, but apart from that, we love to drink lots of alcohol. This is a program aimed at young women. Young women are champion drinkers as well in this country. Uh, and they go out on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, <laughs> for a good drink. Okay, many of them. When they go out, a lot of them get drunk, they, they fall over, bang their head, break their wrists, end up in A&E. And that is very expensive. Okay? It costs a lot of money, policemen taking them, ambulance services and so on. So the police service and health services down in the West Country came up with this scheme. Okay, let's stop them falling over and ending up in A&E. How do we do that? That's the behaviour. Don't fall over. Um, can we get them to stop drinking alcohol or reduce, moderate? Answer, no. Okay, they're going to drink alcohol. We tried that. doesn't work. You know, we've spoken to them. It's not going to work. Other main cause of falling over is this. High heel shoes. Okay, can we get them to go out wearing more flat, sensible shoes? No. Okay. Like looking good, like feeling good, and so on. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we create some value for people that addresses that behaviour. We could say, don't do it, it's bad, don't drink, wear flat shoes. No, what we do is we give them flip flops, what we call flip flops, or Americans would call uh, thongs. Um, in the right shade, policemen carry a few of these in their little bag. They see a girl come out, she's a bit wobbly, they go and say hello. Um, see you're a bit unsteady on your feet. Uh, would you like a pair of these? Think, oh, thanks very much. These are killing me anyway. Take them off. Doesn't fall over. Okay? They worked out they need to stop two people a year falling over for the scheme to pay for itself. This also creates a much better dynamic between the police and these revellers. They're not, oh, you're a bad person, I'm the police. It's, would you like something? Yeah, oh, thanks very much. Okay? They also give them lollipops. Any, any idea why they might do that? is to shut them up. <laughs> okay. uh, they also give one to their boyfriend, because that when there's book, girl, boy, mm, talking to my girlfriend, I'll have a lollipop. <laughs> Shuts him up as well. Okay. This is a way of creating a solution to a social problem that is about it's driven by understanding what's going on in here, what will work, what will not work for people, and working with that, okay? Not starting with the solution. 
to what social marketing is. We need to make it easy uh, for people to make that change as well. This is a relatively easy switch to make, isn't it? It's not, oh, I'm never going to wear uh, high heel shoes again or I'm going to moderate my drinking. No, this was an easy thing and fun thing to do. And we can do that. Uh, this is an example from the kind of pet world about you know, creating social activities that you can join in with on, you know, join online and then go out and walk with other, uh, other dog walkers. Okay, uh, we know people. Uh, this is in case in the, in the example of trying to encourage people to kind of uh, exercise more as themselves, but also exercise their dogs and, and, and cats, which they don't. Uh, you know, this research shows that having a canine companion can be one of the best motivators for staying active. 70% of survey participants said that they would rather exercise with their dog than with a personal trainer. And 68 would choose exercise with their dog over exercising with a friend, not over a friend in general, ex exercising with a friend. Okay. So let's tap into these ideas to create social programs. Uh, one of the concepts that I, I came up with looking at all the evidence around promoting exercise uh, for animals, yeah, thank you, uh, is this concept of together, based on the evidence that we have about what works. The few good studies that are out there tend to indicate if you exercise with your pet, you're much more likely to continue doing that exercise and uh, you and your pet getting benefit uh, from it. Um, it wasn't this kind of uh, together. <laughs> okay. Do it actively together. Uh, Co-creation, I've mentioned, as being one of these ways of creating social value getting people to work together. And, and the point that was made earlier about reaching out and working with other organisations. Uh, one of the biggest problems, I think, is when we sit in our room or with our colleagues in our organisation and think, how are we going to fix this problem? That's a huge trap. It's not your job to fix the problem on your own. Your job is to find others, other organisations, other individuals, uh, other networks to work with to create a solution. One of the key tasks in, in social marketing is what we call coalition development. Day one, job one, who else can we work with on this to create more of an effort? And there are some great examples from around the world. This is one called uh, uh, EPODE, started in France, uh, a healthy towns movement, where it, where it starts is let's get everybody together with every asset that we have to create some solutions. Uh, sorry, understand the problem and then create some solutions. Um, so it's all about co-production, you know, uh, co-value development, co-testing, co-evaluation, engaging people in creating solutions. Okay. Social networks, of course, now, the last uh, 10 or so years, have really helped with that, make it much more accessible and easy to use. Um, I think it is really important that we engage with social networks, particularly for, for uh, younger people, but increasingly older adults as well. I certainly do uh, tweet and, uh, and so on. Okay. Citizen insight driven. We know that in terms of uh, pet owners, um, that they don't even see uh, things like exercise and obesity as a big problem. Um, we need to understand in the case of uh, overfeeding, lack of exercise, that it's not just about food or activity, it's about understanding about how to influence your pet. We almost need to teach people, we do need to teach people to be behavioural psychologists to an extent in terms of creating the right kind of feeding and exercise programmes. So understanding uh, that includes things like this, um, all drawn from social psychology, uh, ways of actually influencing your pet. Okay? Understanding also that when we're speaking to audiences, there's no good spraying and praying. What we need to do is have different interventions for different people. This is where the notion of segmentation comes in in social marketing. Insight segmented by different groups. Anybody guess who this is? Somebody I think whispered Charlie. Yeah, it's Prince Charles. Uh, but it's also um, Ozzy Osbourne. Okay. If you're trying to influence them, demographics understanding is not enough. You need to get inside their head and understand beliefs, motivations, and, and so on. Okay. So segmentation is largely focused on why people act as they do. We need to understand that and then have slightly different projects or programs for different segments. It might be veterinarians. They may not be veterinarians. There's probably 20 different types or 10 different types of veterinarians. 
that we need to think about differently. Okay, so we need demographics, who are they? We need to understand what they're doing and we need to understand why they're doing things. Okay. We also need explicit behavioural objectives. Some of you, if you're from the UK, will all remember a few months back uh, this programme where millions of pounds were spent on a programme aimed at children in deprived areas. And I, you know, I'm interested in evaluation. I do a lot of work on evaluation of projects. When you look at this uh, evaluation, 11 pages, uh, sorry, five of the 11 pages are just pictures. There's no stats, there's no data, there's no objectives. Uh, let's just throw some money at the problem and that'll solve it. No. Okay. What we have to have is smart objectives. What are we trying to achieve with whom, by when, by how much? Okay. Uh, again, if you're from the UK, you'll know the Change for Life programme. It has these eight specific objectives in terms of influencing behaviour aimed at six different target groups, okay? executed in six different ways. Okay. So we need to get more into a performance culture. Uh, one, just so we can check whether we're spending our money appropriately, but also adding to the evidence base, because the evidence base about effective interventions at the moment in this field is not strong. Okay. Competition analysis, and this is really the last kind of um, big thing I want to talk about before we wrap up. We need to understand what is getting in the way. It's not sufficient to create programs that make it easier and encourage people to do the right thing. What we also have to do is reduce or remove the barriers. In, in competitive uh, 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 private sector marketing, we're interested in competition analysis and in action to chop the legs off the competition. We need to do the same in the, in the field of animal welfare. What is the competition doing? What can we do to attack and reduce their impact as well. Okay. So, you know, one of the bits of competition are probably for things like uh, uh, act, taking activity uh, with pets and so on, is the environments are not right. The environments are part of the problem. So what can we do about working with environmental organisations, parks and recreation and so on to encourage this? Um, I don't have time to show you this video, unfortunately, but I really recommend it. Anybody been watching the Paralympics? Hopefully lots of you have. You know, it's been, been absolutely fabulous. Channel 4, go on to YouTube and uh, you know, follow this, this link that's there. It's called Superhumans. It is the most, one of the most inspirational ads I've ever seen. And the, the theme tune uh, from it now, from Public Enemy Number 1, is almost the anthem in this country of the kind of uh, para-athletes. Uh, you know, Incredibly moving. This is based on insight and understanding and segmenting the audience. They know who they were going after. The, the, the audience for this target, for this video, set of Channel 4 promotions, was uh, people who were sceptical about buying tickets to go and see the Paralympics. This changed the way we look at um, disability in this country. I would put it no, no uh, less than that. Okay. So we need to understand people, get inside their heads and create solutions that work for them. Okay. okay, so just to sum up, how do we develop programs that can use this understanding? Recognise that pet health, uh, sorry, pet health and welfare is an integral part of a wider primary prevention challenge. You should be working with your colleagues in public health, my colleagues in public health, stopping them, one of the problems is thinking it's a joke, and seeing the real connections that there are between animal welfare and human welfare. Fighting with your, you know, deriving pleasure from fighting with your dog is a deeply um, unpleasant thing that indicates there's lots wrong with the human beings, um, uh, much more than obviously what's, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of terrible consequences for the job, dogs as well. Okay. Uh, integrate pet health with wider primary prevention and public health responses. Uh, link in with some of these big public health movements uh, across the world uh, to tackle uh, the issue of animal welfare. Invest more in research, I would say. That's research in terms of finding out do intervention studies work or not, but also understanding more about beliefs and attitudes and segmenting audiences that we're seeking to, to influence. Uh, embrace experimentation. Uh, obviously, what we want is uh, uh, randomised control trials if we can, but if not, 
you know, good, well-constructed, well-written-up case studies would also help. Uh, apply systematic social marketing. Don't guess and have a go. I mean, certainly experiment, but experiment using a systematic process that you can demonstrate right? and others can understand. Uh, apply these principles. Think about creating social value. Then think how you're going to develop that, co-develop that with people, how you're going to use insight, how you're going to set some explicit goals, and how you're going to analyse the competition and do something about it. These four uh, key concepts here. Okay. And I guess lastly is sustain the effort. What we need is more long-term... I would say... Um, the, I don't like the word campaign. Okay? <coughs> campaign implies short-term. What we're involved in here is an intergenerational change programme. So we need long-term programmes as well as individual campaigns uh, within them. So we need long-term strategy. Multiple waves of, of programmes. Okay? Not just one-off programmes, oh, we ran it for six months, end. Okay? No. Keep at it. <coughs> Refine and adjust your strategy in the light of evaluation. Okay? It's the way that you know, the really successful commercial marketing operations work like this. They, don't, they know they're not going to get it right, even when they've tested something to death <coughs> before they execute it. We do it at scale and we're still learning and we refine, refine, refine as we go. Okay. And the last thought is, um, if you work in this way, it's also a deeply rewarding and respectful way to work. Because what you're saying is, you're not saying, I'm the expert or we're the experts, we've decided what the problem is and what the solutions are, we're going to influence you. What you're saying is, I want to work with you, my audiences, to create solutions. Okay? This is something that will win you respect and connection with those audiences, as well as make more effective programmes. And don't forget to buy these fabulous books. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>